Doing well. How are you? Okay. I'm okay. Well, I, you know, you, speaking of uh, everything that's going on, and um, you know, have you spoken to the governor this morning? How is she doing? Uh, we messaged this morning. Uh, I spoke to her briefly last night. Uh, you know, I mean, her spirits are up, and uh, you know, she just have to get through this situation that we're going through. Yeah. Okay. And you know, what message at this point do you have for the people of Guam? I know this actually shook a lot of people last night when we first broke the news uh, when Adeloupe sent out the press release. Well, I think uh, what I'd like to ask the people of Guam to do is continue to um, try and protect them, protect each other and protect themselves. So um, you can see that in the governor's case, right, she got exposed from a family member. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, one thing, one sobering thing is for those of us that are um, family, but we're not in the same household, you really do have to take extra precautions because we still have active cases. And of course, last week with uh, more than 50 new cases coming in um, or being uh, recorded, uh, plus all the additional um, uh, things that are happening, right? We, over the last few weeks, we had um, a very structured way of reopening and um, last week we made a decision uh, to um, try and in the interest of everybody roll back some of the openings temporarily that included the bars and then really uh, going into uh, the restrictions on the funerals and these are very especially the funeral it's very um, you know contrary to what we're used to because this island you right. know we express ourselves um, you know we put our hearts on our shoulders and we really want to be there for people when they're going through pain and hardship. But at this time and um, understanding from some of the, the data that we got briefed on by public health, you know, there was some spread at funerals and at social events. So really trying to take precautions and uh, ask everybody to continue to do their part. It's people are tired because it's already uh, been five months since we've been in this posture. Um, and, you know, people are really wanting to normalize, but uh, we just need to hold on a bit longer to try and keep the, contain the spread and um, try and reduce any opportunity that we are, we have to, spread it to our family, friends, or even our coworkers or colleagues at work. Thanks, LT. And, you know, um, I know you've been working very closely with the Department of Education uh, these past uh, couple couple months. Um, we've had a number of parents who've expressed concerns about sending children to uh, schools next week. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And, you know, what message do you have to, to parents as you know we go through the last few days before what we anticipate as the start of the school year? I think the uh, first tool that I think that um, they need to consider using is the choice that they that the family has been given on whether or not to allow face-to-face -face, uh, instruction or to choose a very foreign uh, and new thing with online learning and the distance learning. And it is going to be slow to start because we've, we're not used to this. You know, uh, classrooms and children require a lot of interaction and contact. And um, mm -hmm. early on, a lot of the doctors, the physicians advisory group, they um, have been um, talking about all of the reasons why we need to try and find a safe path for uh, children to return to school. Uh, but um, I think the very, the, I think the first, thing to do is to take a look at your personal situation and to uh, make a decision that's best for your family. Uh, yesterday I met with the superintendent. We've been meeting regularly um, via Zoom. Uh, that's the new wave, I guess. Um, but I met with this team yesterday and it really was to understand, um, you know, what state of readiness that the Department of Education has. I brought um, in the Director of Public Health um, and then the Public Works team with School Bus Operations um, and Civil Defense to further um, respond to what their needs are. The first um, or a big response we did was providing PPEs to all of the schools through the Department of Education 
um, uh, to take the place of uh, orders that they had thought that they were going to be able to secure through the Defense Logistics Service. But as okay. you know from national media, uh, PPE is still um, a commodity. So we're able to provide them adequate supply um, to suit their plans. Uh, and of course, the, the governor, um, when she made the decision to go to PCOR 3, engaged uh, a cross-section of the community, but really guided by um, the folks at Public Health and um, the Physicians Advisory Group about uh, when we would authorize schools to reopen. And there have been pressures, especially from the private schools, to uh, be able to have the authority to open even at the end of July. Um, but we had to um, kind of space it out and make sure that um, the environment was such. However, last week with the additional cases, um, you know, the concern is to make sure that public health and DOE um, are working uh, jointly, not cooperatively or collaboratively, but jointly uh, to plan for um, what could be, uh, what we would expect uh, could be a case to arrive from the school system. So um, in, in many ways, hold on for a minute, let me get my mask on. Uh, in many ways to make sure that we're responding to what their needs are because they have the decision to uh, go into to, uh, authorize school opening. Of course, uh, as you saw last week when the governor receded the, um, the uh, authority for bars to open and suspended that for two weeks along with the funerals, we won't hesitate to uh, make further action if the evidence of community spread is there and there's concern. So, um, of course, I am concerned, like all the parents, and our meeting yesterday was to uh, try and track what the posture of the Department of Education was. Um, and they've expressed uh, confidence that they have, uh, that, they're, that they're ready. Um, but, you know, I think to further that, I've asked everybody to, um, well, first of all, I asked the public health director to make himself available to the Board of Education to this afternoon. Uh, so that the Board of Education can make their uh, decision on what uh, course of action to uh, proceed with. Uh, I understand In terms of opening classes on, on the 17th? Right, right, right. As I understand from the superintendent, internally amongst the board members, there's a discussion, um, a lot of concerns from parents and teachers. I've heard uh, concerns as well. I mean, I come from a family of educators, so I'm mm -hmm. listening, you know, kind of like a... Um, um, and the forefront with a lot of my aunts that are in the school system, you know, that are uh, working to prepare. People are very nervous, of course. Um, but I think what the key thing is going to be is I've asked them on Thursday, uh, no matter what the decision of DOE is to today, the Board of Education, I've asked them to, uh, for civil defense to uh, conduct a tabletop exercise so that they can map out all of the different uh, response processes and protocols in case any concerns uh, creep up in the school system or even uh, in the school buses uh, when they operate to support. But I would just say that um, I hear the concerns, me too, I am concerned and I'm wanting to make sure that uh, everybody is ready. And so we're monitoring it. That sort of leads to the next question, sir. You know, a lot of people are asking, well, what happens? What happens if uh, a child comes into school or a teacher comes into school, staff, anyone comes into the school uh, and they do show symptoms um, or do test positive? You know, what is the process there? Do we shut down the entire school? Are parents called in to pick up the children? Because uh, that can be very disruptive to, you know, to not just instructional time, but to a working parent's school. Uh, work day. Right, right, right. Uh, so first of all, if uh, a faculty member or a student has any symptom, they need to stay home. Uh, and I think that we saw in, um, in um, I think in the case of Duaneus, Father Duaneus, where a faculty member came in, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you're not feeling well, um, or you know that you've been exposed, uh, then you need to uh, to a positive, you need to take your precautions and stay home. Um, public health uh, has developed, um, uh, as I understand, I haven't seen it yet because uh, they're uh, presenting that or working on that with Department of Education, actually a process and procedure step by step on what would happen. Decisions to, um, I believe the decision 
to close schools will be jointly made uh, by uh, public health with Department of Education. And then it will be based on the contact tracing uh, situation that would determine to what extent um, a school is closed, portions of a school. I think one mitigating factor that I've seen in the DOE plans is that um, they've been uh, taking precautions or at least coming up with a framework that segregates uh, students uh, from each other um, from different classrooms and uh, even as basic as uh, making the directional areas, the walking areas one way. Um, that's something we saw in national news where that really wasn't the case in that Georgia high school where all the students were cluttered. So one of the other things that I've asked them is I wanted to kind of get a gauge on what the amount of children were talking about. And so as I understand it, based on registration, some schools, I think uh, the superintendent told me that Daniel L. Paris School and Elementary School in Jigo is expecting only 9% of their student population for face-to-face. -face. And amongst that 9%, they are going to continue to do three um, tracks. Um, the, great, the highest number of percent that they're, they're expecting, and that includes um, assuming that parents who did not register for online would push to face-to-face, -to -face. I think it's somewhere around 22% um, uh, in uh, middle schools like FB Leon Guerrero. Um, and so, uh, they, it's, so what DOE is currently planning is a very dramatically smaller amount of uh, students that are going to, um, that have signed up for face-to-face -face, and on top of that, segregating them or dividing them into three uh, cadres in which they would, um, each cadre would only be on campus at a single time. It's a lot of planning and logistics, including predicting what the level of support um, that um, uh, is going to be offered and secured with school buses uh, to, to make sure that uh, we maintain our posture of reducing the occupancy of school buses uh, right. where children are only going to be one to a bench. Um, and including on that, I've asked, uh, I've instructed uh, civil defense to task um, the appropriate uh, personnel, could be guardsmen, it just depends on the planning, appropriate people to be on board buses uh, if and when bus uh, service starts with uh, with face-to-face uh, -face instruction to make sure that uh, the students are um, are practicing the social distancing and uh, staying safe. So the way I see it, Oya, is um, we want to give every opportunity, er every um, area that uh, it needs some support, we want to be there. And at least right now, since we've not, uh, since uh, the schools are authorized to open, uh, I'll wait to see what uh, the Board of Education decides at three and then um, figure out how we can support them. Now, if the Board of Education decides um, like other school districts, I think the state of Hawaii has now moved um, their entire uh, school population or so I read to online learning, then uh, that also requires a response. And so just on Friday, uh, the superintendent gave us uh, his allocation of the $41 million of uh, education support funding for all the students of Guam. And that's not just for DOE students, but it is all students from any school that had been operating at least one year prior to um, the COVID situation. And so uh, I have a group looking at that right now and identifying other projects and other allocations that we can push in to support online learning, distance learning. And those would include uh, you know, stepping up uh, connectivity in public facilities. Um, we talked about libraries. The superintendent has recommended that we add uh, community centers um, and senior set in, uh, centers that are not being used uh, throughout the island. Um, I'm also uh, wa uh, wanting to see whether or not we could include some of the social halls that support some of the parochial schools that are online to try and give access. And then Figuring out, uh, we also are going to be uh, increasing the support for PBS to support um, PBS University, which they launched um, at the end of the last semester to right. have additional opportunities and then um, different things. Uh, 
I'm trying to understand also there's a solicitation DOE made to the telecom providers that also give will give us some guidance because at the get go are all we also want to try and address um, since we want to try and if people want to stay home, then how do we uh, bring or expand connectivity in the house that is a logistical thing to sort out but that's really uh, those are all the things that now we want to move into support that side. Right, because when you talk about, sir, 9% of the school student population uh, doing face-to-face, -face, you're talking about 30,000 students um, and what? So you're well, at least the... in that school, But at least in that school, 9% oh. of the 600 enrolled, right? That was the lowest. Uh, uh, he told me that was the lowest, you know. So on average, I would, I would just estimate high. If it's 22%, you know, if, uh, or more, of, it is a large number of students with multiple um, grade levels in the home. Right. But even during a regular school year, you've got a number of students, um, even within DL, DL Paris, um, which has a high population of students who qualify, for example, for the school lunch meal program. Throughout uh, the public System. Right. And so when you think about that and you think about the number of students on a regular school year who don't have access to computers, um, some of whom some children don't even have power running to their homes. You know, how right. do you how do you support them in a COVID related in a COVID school year and ensure that they're getting an adequate education? Yeah, no, I think that's the that's the challenge. And um, I think the, for me, I'm trying to understand all the different ways that uh, the schools, DOE and the other schools have identified that we can be, that the uh, greater government can do to help folks uh, get that connectivity. Um, they're in their spending plans um, that they've submitted. There is each school pretty much has a big allotment of, um, of uh, personal devices or even laptops or tablets. Um, there's a set aside throughout all the public and private schools for that. And I think the um, one of the logistical challenges I feel is going to be the whether or not the devices are available in that quantity and when they would be available. So there, this thing is going to, the way I see it and based on the information I've seen from DOE, um, it, you know, it's going to continue to evolve. And um, I, my interest is trying to figure out how we can jumpstart or uh, give, uh, give the schools uh, fast track options to meet the demands of their students. There is a disruption. This is a very disruptive situation. I mean, we're not operating in a normal, in normalcy, but what are the things we can, I'd like, you know, what are the things we can do to try and, and help them as we continue to move forward? It's a stressful time. Not, not, all, not all parents, you know, are around for to help the kids with the schoolwork. I mean, right. you know, uh, there's, we have a low uh, uh, participation rate in, already for parent-teacher um, organization and school outreach uh, in our school district. And that is even um, kind of underscoring the challenge. Um, and to kind of move the discussion just along just a little bit, um, you know, you have, you spoke about the, number, uh, the homeless shelters and um, having children there. What's being done to assist those children getting them back into school? Well, many of the kids are already in school or were in school. Um, and so I think the logistical issue that uh, that we're supporting um, has to do with uh, making sure that they are where to support where they're going to be signed up. So there are about 21 children uh, under the 17 and below that are in the shelter right now. Um, the school age uh, yeah, and maybe uh, about uh, maybe 65 percent of them are school age. Uh, and so the, the actual casework and the case support right now is being performed under contract by Catholic Social Services. And so I periodically um, meet with um, Diana Calvo and Paula Perez from that organization to understand what are the different things that uh, we need to do to increase uh, or to facilitate. It could be transportation and that's something that's already being looked at, you know, for that population. But um, 
that is a group that that is under our care right now and um, and whatever they need uh, we would want to provide yeah. um, sir and I know you touched on this last week a little bit uh, but with respect to the homeless shelters I know they're you re um, you re-signed the contract right to re or sorry renewed the contract uh, for so the homeless the, shelter yeah so the contract as I understand it from GSA uh, it's it's uh, month to month right that's because it's in 30-day intervals but basically the uh, instruction and the guarantee is that uh, we do we we are going to provide this group shelter period uh, and uh, and the challenge right now is identifying another one uh, probably in the Tumuning Tuman area that would be able to um, uh, provide shelter options for all the unsheltered that are in that area they're still unsheltered there. Uh, the priority has been identifying um, uh, families, children, individuals with disabilities. Um, and in fact, five of the individuals um, that initially came in have been um, uh, identified as eligible for um, a further housing uh, as individuals with disabilities. So uh, as we continue the effort, um, they'll continue doing the casework and then we just need to try and bring on resources or facilities to, to keep up with the demand. This demand is, and it's really for unsheltered folks. There are homeless people that are in living in substandard um, uh, housing. That is another area that our council will be, is focused on, but at least for the shelter right now, it is for unsheltered individuals. So at this point, sir, how many people do you guys estimate um, still require sheltering? Well, you know what, there's been some outreach. Uh, part of it is giving them options. There are some people that uh, were identified during outreach that uh, declined to get the shelter. Um, and, uh, and that means we just, the casework site needs to understand why that is. Uh, but um, I would say that there's, I would guesstimate that there are at least uh, over 20 more that, um, that have been identified in outreach that uh, we would want to, uh, pro uh, offer shelter in the Tumuning Tuman area. And most of these are uh, single adults. Okay. Sorry, and then just kind of going back to the contract, the 82, roughly $90,000 a month that this is costing us, um, where is that money coming from? So the money was identified uh, from BBMR. Um, and I'll have to, to be honest with you, Oya, I'll have to verify whether or not it was through the governor's transfer authority uh, or whether or not uh, it was uh, through um, the CARES Act. I'll have to find out what um, Mr. Carlson um, did to identify the funds. Uh, right, I, I know he's making decisions based also on what has been determined to be uh, eligible for uh, reimbursement so we can maximize all the different fund sources that we have. But can I get back to Crystal's here? So I'll, I'll get Thank back you. to you. Um, we'll get a, an answer to you. Okay, okay. Um, and then speaking of BBMR, uh, we know that there was uh, someone who tested positive, I believe, um, at the office. Do you know how that, that office is doing at this point? Okay, I did not hear that anybody tested positive yesterday. I was told that uh, BBMR staff was um, working remotely because somebody had been exposed. I oh, haven't exposed been, positive, uh, I, but um, I haven't been informed or briefed uh, by uh, public health or um, anybody in the government about that particular situation yet. Um, okay. But fair I enough. Maybe I'll, Crystal can give us uh, a, an update. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's the perfect segue, sir, to talk about the budget. Um, we're looking at two different numbers. The, there's not too much of a, uh, of a difference between uh, what the governor's office and what OFB um, have submitted. Um, do you think that senators will be able to kind of consolidate that relatively quickly considering, um, you know, both the legislature has to go through the rest of the budget and then, uh, you know, in, in terms of who gets what as, as far as allocations in this reduced um, budget, and then making sure that the governor has enough time to go through it 
uh, before the August 31st deadline. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that, um, you know, they'll be provided the information and they have to make the decision based on um, the revenue tracking and the collections. And I just maybe want to add that I think that um, uh, Revan Tax has been, it's no secret that they've been really expanding or increasing collections and making sure everybody pays their fair share. And based on that collection in uh, history, um, you know, they, the legislature has to balance that with, you know, kind of projecting what the unknown factors are, you know, mm -hmm. because there's a big, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, suspension, you know, I, I'll call it suspension because our source markets are not allowing their citizens to travel without being quarantined upon their return. Um, that obviously impacts um, the situation, you know, with the, with the short-term uh, recovery of the island. Uh, but uh, I'd say that, you know, where I think we're, I'm, I'm hopeful and confident the legislature, you know, they'll do their job they'll get their budget to go, they'll figure out what the uh, revenue amount will be. And then, you know, we'll take it from there. I guess, you know, it's one of those things where we have to monitor things can change, as you know, uh, right. in a minute, right? And so we'll see what the final product is of the legislature. Okay. And sir, a lot of the... the but I, I, wanted to add, though, I wanted to add, though, that, you know, there are certain issues I know that um, they need to tackle with. For example, there has to be a maintenance of effort at the Department of Education to make sure that um, the the uh, uh, that um, their average expenditures um, and spend for education are going to be maintained to a certain level, um, or else it may impact uh, their continued eligibility to uh, receive the forty some million dollars from education. That's you know that's kind of like one effort. Then there are agencies that are reliant on funds that are not very stable. There is customs and user, the customs user fee obviously has right. gone down tremendously and they have a, uh, an operation where the bulk of it is with airport support. You know, uh, so there's little nuances that they need to address. And then uh, those are all the factors that we'll look at with the governor when the budget bill is passed. Right. And, and speaking of which, I know that um, a portion of the CRER was provided to the legislature um, yesterday, and that spoke more to um, the, the general fund. Um, but with respect to like the special funds, which Lester had raised yesterday, you know, and, and you're talking about just now, a lot of those special funds have been under collecting, uh, some even prior to COVID, um, you know, the the uh, TEFF is one of those, is a, is a prime example right. of that. And you spoke about education and that has always impacted the Department of Education. So considering, you know, the budget numbers at this point, you know, how are, how are those agencies um, that do rely on, on TEFF as well as the TAF um, and other agencies, how are you guys expecting to support them and ensure that they're able to provide the same level of service or at least the very basic levels of service? I think one way, uh, at least for the TEFF, is uh, if the legislature gives us some flexibility uh, to uh, go ahead and release appropriations um, to the Department of Education, um, despite, you know, and allow the uh, governor the flexibility to use general fund revenues to try and make good on uh, supporting education. That was the situation we occurred that occurred this past year when there was a delay in the implementation of the, of the increase for the residential homes that were um, um, uh, uh, evaluated at a million dollars, appraised at a million dollars or more. And then it caused uh, uh, an issue for DOE where uh, the governor did, was not able to release the appropriations tied to TEFF um, at that time. But, um, you know, we find other ways, you know, the governor also tapped uh, federal funds under discretion to uh, support Department of Education um, this right. past year. And, uh, you know, uh, we see them as a partner, you know, we don't have full control, but, uh, uh, but, you know, when they're, especially on their capital needs, uh, trying to make sure that uh, they also make progress on um, getting that A&E contract done for Simon Sanchez and 
uh, moving forward with the capital projects because I think moving forward on the capital projects is also going to help the economy. We never shut down construction uh, and uh, trying to make sure that we get all these CIPs um, permitted and into the market so that uh, we can have uh, additional economic activity and uh, at the same time in improve the public facilities is is something that I'd like to is something that I'm in particular looking forward to try and pushing uh, through the next year or so and beyond but especially now given the situation with with the with the economy Sir, so you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the governor's ability to transfer funds to cover some of those shortfalls. I think in the current budget, um, it's we're at about 10 percent transfer authority. Um, OFB has said that they're willing to negotiate that up to a level where the governor feels comfortable um, in ensuring that, you know, she can kind of manage what monies we do have, what resources the government does have to, you know, cover what needs to be covered. Um, has that been a discussion that you've been privy to and, you know, do you guys anticipate that it's going to go up to, you'll be requesting a 15% uh, transfer authority, maybe 20%? I'm not sure what the uh, percent is going to be. The legislature, right, will determine that. But, uh, you know, giving uh, tools to the governor, you know, in a situation where we're dealing with this pandemic, I think would, is wise uh, in order to try and um, keep things moving. I think we've done remarkably well with uh, collections and trying to keep um, government spending uh, sustaining, uh, combined with the military spending to really try and uh, mitigate the economic reality of uh, this loss of uh, tourism for you know the short term and, and as we strategize how to get things moving. I would just say that um, making significant progress um, and demonstrating that our island is able to respond to um, these additional cases, like the ones that we saw last week. Um, uh, our mission is to make sure that we need, we uh, get the response done so that um, our people feel safe, are confident that, um, that uh, they're able to um, be seen and be treated in case there's an issue. Uh, and that kind of uh, confidence and that kind of system uh, make is an advantage for us as we go into the future with um, tourism and the source markets. And also, I, I would just say on tourism, I think that the tourist sector does have a considerable amount of work, of course, with our support to do to, um, to prove to our community uh, that, you know, there's going to be a safe strategy uh, to returning that sector uh, but right now, with the Japanese cases and the increase, the white cases and the increase, and uh, now our situation last week, we just need to uh, hone in on the public health side and make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can and that the systems we put in place and the resources we're putting in place are going to respond the best way we can. Sir, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of skip forward just a little bit. Um, one of the sort of most recent criticisms, if you will, um, or concerns is from bar owners who are saying, hey, if there's one or two bars that aren't uh, providing, you know, who aren't following the guidelines, who aren't ensuring that their customers are, are practicing social distancing, who aren't, you know, making sure that they're following the capacity regulations um, provided by uh, DPHSS, uh, why not just shut those down instead of shutting down the entire industry? I think that if you uh, take a look in see the literature that and the experience that has happened in the U.S. and abroad, um, you'll see that, um, you know, I think the very nature of the social aspect of the bar lends itself to, um, you know, being a, um, a very efficient way of spreading the virus. And so I just asked the bar owners, you know, we're just asking right now for two weeks to try and make sure that uh, our contact track, tracking mechanisms are working to identify all the folks that have been exposed to, to uh, identify the additional positives that have happened because of transmission and to try and get our numbers more steady so that we can go back and, and open. 
Um, and so, I, you know, I mean, it is a situation where if you're a bar owner, obviously this is your livelihood. It's a problem. Uh, but right. right now, public health is the big consideration. And right. uh, I mean, and not just for them, they they also support, you know, a number of employees. Yeah, sure. But, you know, like I said, you know, you need to make sure that everybody is safe so that we can go out and um, and resume these liberties, you know, going mm -hmm. out. And I mean, this is obviously a fundamental of being in a democracy, enjoying life, freedom and liberty. But unfortunately, we have to take a pause on, on the situation with the bars just to make sure that we can contain the spread that, it, that has occurred. Okay. Um, sir, I, I guess the, the very last thing is, you know, the, some of the senators were concerned that the budget um, was sort of painting a rosy picture, uh, not just from OFB, but also from the governor's office. Uh, you've had folks also, again, from the business community who've said uh, the, you know, once December, once December hits and the PUA runs out, um, we're not going to have the same level of support that we've seen, you know, since um, April, March, March or April. Um, I get what is the plan moving forward? I, I, are you guys prepared to to revisit the budget um, in case you know, in case we lose a lot of that that federal uh, funding and Congress doesn't come up with a plan to expand it? Um, you know, I know they're challenging, some there's talk about challenging what the president has actually come up with as far as his executive orders to, assist, to provide assistance for unemployment. Um, and that's, a, according to Lester, that's where a lot of the, the increase that we weren't anticipating came from. Um, you know, what is the plan looking forward? I think, well, I, think, I think for us, the governor's been very firm that uh, we're not going to She's not interested in uh, uh, getting in a situation where we're going to uh, basically increase the deficit and do a lot of deficit spending. So if the situation is that bleak where there's a collapse in the national leadership uh, with regards to the assistance that all the states and territories need, all the people of the United States, including the people here in the territories need, then obviously it's going to be a big uh, reset and everybody in the elected leadership, especially the legislature that is in charge of the purse strings, will have to um, do I have will have to take appropriate action. But until that point, until that point, I would say, um, as a government and as one of the foundations of the economy, uh, I'd like to see us continue move our programs down, spend the capital improvement projects, return to uh, all of the regular uh, spending that has been budgeted uh, that has uh, that is provided for including and especially with the federal funds all the CIPs bond projects you know we have airport expansion all those things need to continue to move the per folks that are processing the permits need to be there so that we can at least uh, uh, not compound uh, the problem with the, with the loss of tourism. But obviously, if you're seeing deep declines uh, in uh, revenues and uh, the governor and I monitor uh, cash collections daily, um, the, the moment that she sees something, she always will go out and, um, and uh, amend what we're doing. Uh, and, you know, I think that that it's a dynamic situation. You know, there's a lot of unknown factors, but, you know, uh, it really is not cliche to say that we are all in this together. We truly are. And, um, and although there are disagreements and sometimes um, the amount of trust that uh, senators have uh, in each other and over on our side, you know, it's, it's a political issue many times, but you need to be able to set most of that aside or all of it aside and make the decisions because we're gonna we're gonna no matter what we're gonna have to deal with the consequences that what is what the people of guam elected us to do and we will stand by all of the decisions we make and they're gonna have an opportunity to let them know let us know if they agree or disagree okay sir you've been very generous with your time um you know, so i want to thank you for spending some time with us today i think i just one final question uh, that just popped in uh is has everyone at Adaloop been tested? Is everyone there okay? Um, you know, I guess a lot of people are just concerned that 
you know, the, the seat of, of the, the governor um, and, you know, yourself as well. You know, we just sure. kind of so, want to make sure that uh, are, are healthy. Yeah, so not everybody has been tested yet. Uh, you know, the contact tracing um, uh, uh, has to occur, but of course we all know those of us that have been exposed, um, we have to amend what we're doing. So for me, for example, I'm, I have uh, canceled all in-person meetings. I've moved uh, whatever can be moved to, on, to Zoom or Teams, it's been moved. Uh, and try and lighten um, the schedule so that we can reduce um, at least the physical interaction so we can reduce the spread. Um, those are the little things we're doing. And then uh, public health will guide us, um, not only with our employees, but uh, those folks that have interacted uh, with the governor or our team over the uh, period of time um, so that we can, everybody has, an, has uh, access to the testing. But I, I, it does not uh, escape me how impactful um, the situation is on our island when the top person, the governor of Guam uh, has now been, uh, has tested positive and uh, now is, you know, dealing with, uh, with fighting the virus in the way that somebody infected is. And, uh, you know, I'd just say that been praying for the governor, her family, and everybody. Uh, I think all of us at this point with more than 400 cases, everybody knows somebody who has uh, been infected or who has survived already um, the virus and it's sobering. And if the only thing that I would leave is take the precautions. And even if you're getting together with your family and you don't share the same household, you might want to wear your mask. I mean, I'll just tell you personally, um, when we got word of the exposure, um, you know, and now with the governor's test, you know, I'll be talking to my mom on the phone. I will not go and physically see her just like I did in March and April because of her um, medical condition. I would just say that everybody probably should follow the same thing. Uh, keep everybody safe um, and do your part. It is sobering and I imagine that it's going to, it underscores all of the anxiety and angst that people already have living right now in this situation. But I just wanna assure everybody that we're doing a, the best we can. We continue to uh, work with all the healthcare experts and making sure that the resource pipeline at public health and all the other medical providers is there so that we can respond to whatever happens. Okay. Well, again, sir, thank you so much for your time. You've thank been very you generous with it. And uh, have a great day. All right. Thanks to your team for all the work that you continue to do, providing the yeah, people with all please, the Please let the governor know we're also praying for her. Um, you know, it's, I, it's, it, again, last night when that news came out, it did shake a lot of people. Um, as you said, it's, it's, it was very sobering. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, by the way, monitor yourselves. If you don't feel good, stay home. Do you have a, you know, we're just be very smart about this. Um, the uh, medical professionals around the island, the clinics, they're all prepared um, for you. And, you know, if, and of course, if all else fails, 311 is, is uh, a number you can call. We have had, I'll just tell you, there is an increased amount of activity in all the hotlines right now as a result uh -huh. uh, of the news. So we'll continue to move forward and, uh, you know, and uh, do the best job uh, for all the people. Okay. Well, thank you thank again you for your time. Okay. okay. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.